series last speaker event of the year, uh, our crowning jewel. Um, Chiara is an Italian philosopher, feminist thinker, creative writer, um, uh, my co-author, co-editor, co-conspirator at the New School, friend and comrade. So I'm really, really delighted to have her here. Chiara has a PhD from the European University Institute. She's worked at the New School's philosophy department since 2010, and she's currently also the director of gender studies uh, at the New School. Her work spans the history of European philosophy, particularly early modern, critical theory, feminism, post and decolonial studies. She's the author of many books, um, starting with A Philosophy of Political Myth, 2007, The Myth of the Clash of Civilizations, co-authored with Benoit Chalon, who happens to also be visiting next week, hosted by the Center for Middle East and North Africa. Imagining Europe, Myth, Memory, and Identity, again co-authored with Benoit Chalon, uh, 2013. Um, Imaginal Politics, Images Beyond the Imagination and Beyond the Imaginary, 2014, and A Feminist Mythology, uh, 2021, and Anarcha-Feminism, also 2021. She's also the editor and co-editor of uh, various different volumes. I will only uh, uh, recite two that are especially important to me. Uh, the Anarchist Turn, uh, co-edited with Jacob Blumenfeld and Simon Critchley, 2013, and Feminism, Capitalism, and Critique, co-edited with yours truly, 2017. Um, Chiara, beyond her prolific uh, career uh, in the academia and uh, in literary circles, I just want to read from her own words how she situates herself, which I think is um, really significant, from her own words. For me, she says, history of philosophy and a critical theory of society are two sides of the same coin. Our interest for the past always reflects the standpoint of the present, but one cannot understand the present without navigating our past. I see philosophy as a critical tool in constant dialogue with other disciplines, as well as an endeavor entangled with other practices for sense making, such as history, arts, and psychoanalysis. So, without further ado, I um, please join me in welcoming Chiara. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for, for this invitation and, and thank you for coming out despite being the end of the semester uh, where everybody is, is exhausted. Um, and uh, exhaustion being one of the effects of uh, uh, the very same system I'm trying to attack uh, in this book. Uh, as a way of a preface, I should say that um, I will try to give a sense of uh, anarcho-feminism, which is a much larger project. It's a almost 400 pages book. Uh, we try to cover, give us a sense of the component. We can expand in the, in, the, in the discussion what is more of an interest to the audience here. I should preface also this by saying that although the book is certainly the result of my uh, philosophical uh, enterprise, uh, is also the result of a perception about political urgency. And the political urgency is determined by the fact that, uh, whereas in the feminist movement, there's so many divisions between different types of feminism, um, and those who are the, the new um, neo-authoritarian uh, macho uh, right that is now proliferating globally knows very well how trans rights, um, feminism, uh, attacks on uh, um, the environment, um, anti racism, how we're all on the same boat, right? So, the politically, the book tries to build um, solidarities that recognize differences between different struggles while at the same time setting up um, possible bridges uh, between them. So this is the sense of uh, the political sense of the book. Uh, I, I begin with the end of the book um, with these two concepts that I put forward 
uh, towards the end of the book in order to distinguish what were traditionally conceived as form of patriarchy. Remember here, patriarchy literally means uh, the ar arche of the patriarch, so the single male head of the family, and what are called new uh, global monocracy. Why did I come up with this new term, uh, monocracy? Uh, because uh, uh, whereas patriarchy means the arche of the male head of the family, the patriarch, by monocracy, I mean the fact that male privilege resists and it takes even new form, even in contexts where patriarchy is questioned and is declining. We have seen, we have assisted to the rise of, uh, uh, even in contexts where uh, the model is a multi-income uh, household, so men are no longer the single breadwinner, even in contexts where there have been uh, um, a, a questioning of the heteronormative matrix, so there are same-sex marriages, um, that are proliferating, even in those contexts, there's a, not only a persistence of uh, all forms of uh, male privilege, but a resignification of that. Right? So, monocracy can thrive even where uh, patriarchy is, is declining. So, in this sense, we can say that these men are no longer the uncontested patriarch of the household, but they're still what I call the first step. So why the first step? Because in comparison to them, not only women, but also two-spirit people, third gender, LGBTQ plus people are all second sexes, so to speak. And I use the notion of second sexes expanding on uh, obviously on Simone de Beauvoir, uh, famous definition of it. So, on one hand, we see the persistence of male privilege in the old form, but on the other, we assist the two new reactive formations uh, yes. that are um, neo-authoritarian, macho form of uh, uh, right-wing politics that are, in my view, must be read as an attempt uh, to combat feminist con con um, questioning. Right. So the more the feminist movement worldwide is stronger, the more we assist to the proliferation of this reactive formation that at times take almost caric caricatural forms, like Trump, uh, Salvini, Bolsonaro, like almost a caricature of the old patterns, uh, so to speak. And for me, that's because they are reactive formations. So why anarcho-feminism in this context? What I will try to say, and map out in this uh, time that I have is why anarcho feminism could has been for me a response to this political situation. Um, why what I call the philosophy of trans individuality is the best uh, philosophical underpinning for such a project. Uh, and why this uh, uh, philosophy of, of trans individuality and anarcho feminism can lead uh, towards a questioning of different forms of ontological hierarchies and what I get in the book I call a form of uh, queer uh, ecology. Okay, so where to start from? Um, I was to start from rethinking the very notion of uh, uh, reproduction. I mean, obviously, feminist work has been doing uh, a very important work on uh, disentangling the very notion of reproduction, beginning with the very division between production and reproduction. I'm not going to expand here on a, a very well-known uh, socialist feminist critique of, of the distinction, just mention the way in which um, production uh, relies on exploitation of wage labor, whereas reproduction relied on the uh, what Maria Mies calls super exploitation of uh, uh, unpaid uh, labor. But in comparison to socialist feminists of the past, what I felt was missing and not so central is the need to rethink reproduction in conjunction with uh, this three new strands of feminist theorizing that in my view also open to new questions. 
So first of all, the fact that the reproduction of life also happens through thanatopolitical uh, um, and racial regimes of reproduction of population, by right? basically distributing chances of life and death across the planet, and very often along racial lines, populations themselves are produced and reproduced. Secondly, the need to think of reproduction by disentangling reproduction from sex, not only because of the questioning of the hetero and cis normative matrix, but also because of uh, the way in which new bioengineers have de facto changed um, uh, reproduction itself. And third, um, to include within the rethinking of reproduction in uh, socialist um, uh, feminism, to include more systematically the reproductive capacity of the more than human. I mean, this is something that in classical uh, Marxist feminism is clearly not central. I think the part that was still heavily influenced by humanism. Um, and what I'm trying to do in this project is also to rethink um, speciesism and, and the idea that um, uh, there are uh, the, the, the distinction between production and reproduction can lead to the exclusion of the way in which plants, animals, and the more than human in general also contributes to the production and reproduction of life. Okay, so why anarcho-feminism? As the, as the framework for these three uh, lines of inquiry, because the, um, what I mean by anarcho-feminism is that you cannot fight sexism without fighting all other forms of oppression, beginning with uh, uh, racism and imperialism, capitalist exploitation, cis and heteronormativity, and uh, uh, anthropocentrism. Um, this may sound like a new idea, but it's been one of the central points of anarcho feminists of the past, precisely to argue that you cannot fight one form of domination uh, without fighting all the others. This may seem like a tension, the idea that there's something specific in uh, monocracy, there's something specific in the oppression of the second sexes, but that in order to fight this, you have to fight all other forms of domination, may appear as a tension, but I hope that by the end of this talk, it will be clear that it's not a tension, but actually a vital um, connection. So, um, what do I mean by anarcho-feminism? I take this, I take this term um, in the United States we've been using in the 70s, but there were examples way back in the past. Uh, for instance, uh, um, Ho Hin Jen. Does anybody know Ho Hin Jen here? So Ho Hin Jen, it was an anarcho-feminist, Chinese early anarcho-feminist, who in 1904 did nothing less than translating the Marxist, Marx and Engels Communist Manifesto into Chinese. Uh, they very clearly forgot about that she did that, uh, but also put up this uh, super interesting anarcho-feminist philosophy that is never read, partly because of uh, feminism is very central in your century canon, uh, but also because uh, it should, her work is being banned uh, in uh, still banned in China, um, it all exists in a partial French uh, and English translations. Uh, even now, you can't read her. But as early as 1904, wrote this uh, incredible text on um, women liberation, basically arguing that you cannot fight patriarchy and the oppression of women without fighting all other forms of domination, in particular imperialism. Uh, and uh, the very way in which what she terms nanu, meaning the gender binary and the division between men and women, reproduce all other forms of capitalist exploitation um, within itself. So in that case, she's inspired by Taoist philosophy, uh, an extraordinary figure, which I still don't know why uh, she's not being read, other figures that I um, I engage in the book include people like Emma Goldman, uh, some black um, feminists uh, uh, from the past. 
But what I want to say is that for me, anarcho feminism is not so much of a tradition, so it's not so much of a canon. I began the book trying to find the anarcho feminist canon, and the more I searched for it, the more I realized that there's actually a contradiction in trying to pin down this. Uh, uh, philosophy into a, a ethnic canon because most of the people who are actually interested in doing this work, connecting um, sexism, the fight against sexism, with the critique of all other forms of domination, they're not usually particularly interested in constructing canons um, or to even traditions. So the more I search for the canon, the more I realize that that was actually not the point. <laughs> of the book, so the book itself transformed me uh, in the very process um, of, uh, of making. So one can at this point argue, okay, but uh, why call it anarcho-feminism and not just anarchism? Anarchism has traditionally been a critique uh, of uh, the anarchist tradition I'm engaging with, the European one, a critique of capitalist exploitation. They put forward the idea you can't criticize Capitalist exploitation when are criticizing the state and all other forms of domination. Well, we tried that way and we saw what happened. What happened in, in uh, European, most of the time in European uh, um, anarchism is that sexism became a secondary issue, something that was perceived as to be addressed later on. Once we have abolished the state, abolished capitalism, then we will handle with sexism. And I think that even with, the, although even within the anarchist tradition, uh, sexism has proliferated uh, because it has never, I mean, it has rarely been put at the level of other forms of uh, uh, oppression uh, and domination. So that's why I insisted in calling the book not just anarcho-feminism, a combination of uh, anarchism and feminism, but anarcho-feminism with the need to um, feminize, uh, feminize the concept so as to make it more visible um, that um, I don't want feminism to get out of the picture. But obviously the form of feminism that I'm interested in uh, is not just feminism as a fight for equality with uh, bourgeois uh, white men. I mean, feminism here means much more broadly um, a struggle against sexist oppression. Um, so sexist oppression that concerns not just women, but sexist oppression that concerns in the first place all the second sexes, but also men themselves, because I think patriarchy is not good for men either. And let's say more about this uh, towards uh, the end of the talk. So why not just feminism? Because feminism we have seen is conceptually compatible with domination. Uh, even the very term feminism, uh, particularly in this country, is often uh, connected with uh, the history of the different feminist waves. So the idea, who is familiar with the feminist waves? Everybody is. Okay, so the idea that first there was a first wave feminism, second wave feminism. Now, first wave feminism means the suffragette movement. So a bunch of white property. Um, people mainly of European origins, so settlers, who started to fight for the equality with men, right? When Emma Goldman, who was an anarcho-feminist, was engaging with this form of feminism, said, well, if that's feminism, I'm not interested in being a feminist. That's just a sharing of privilege between uh, privileged people. Similarly, Native American women, like, well, uh, we actually lost our, for instance, Cherokee um, tribes, they were genocratic. I mean, Cherokee women had their own women's council. So like, well, for us, feminists began in 1492, when uh, uh, because of uh, the settler importing patriarchal values, we have lost our own uh, uh, genocratic traditions, right? So for them, this, uh, for waves that supposedly began with uh, um, the suffragette movement is just a reproduction of the settler colonial narrative according to which everything happened first uh, in Europe and then 
was exported uh, in the Americas. So th this is uh, why I insisted on, uh, and I don't say I'm just a feminist, I say I'm an anarcho-feminist because I think it's important uh, to put for a feminist philosophy that doesn't embrace uh, automatically all these other forms of domination that by operating in the United States and being of European origin, I feel particularly the duty to uh, disentangle myself from. Um, so the epistemology that I adopt in the book is uh, what which uh, we can call a bottom-up epistemology, so epistemology from the margin, uh, taking the position of those who are in the margins, not simply of the United States, but globally speaking, um, and that can see how the different effects of uh, mechanism of domination within a uh, um, uh, global um, capitalist system uh, distributes across the globe possibilities of uh, life uh, and death. So I call um, for, uh, th that's really for me has been always the question, learning from Emma Goldman, Hayden Chen, um, Native American feminists such as Paula Gunalden, uh, or Andrea Smith, other people who have emphasized the connection between uh, heteronormativity and settler colonialism. They've all been raising this question, how can we make sure that the oppressed the second sexes, do not become, in their terms, the oppressors. How can we make sure that white, uh, the white uh, women who are fighting for their own I mean, legitimate claim to political authority will not become, in their turn, sources of oppression for uh, the Cherokee women? Uh, or uh, the uh, women who didn't have access to um, property rights uh, at the time. When you apply, <clears throat> when you apply this globally, uh, for me, this what this also means is uh, um, adopting uh, what a form of epistemic subordination. I've been uh, born and raised in Europe and trained within. Uh, um, we got the, the following charts means the boundaries of white epistemologies. So I've had to do a lot of work to just develop a curiosity for the traditions I had not been trained in. So basically, history of European philosophy. Uh, and I have to say, um, this book took a long time in the making because I tried to be outside of my comfort zones. Um, obviously, I could only read it in general translations, but anyway, the work is not available in a, a modern Chinese either, so it's not available in translation. Uh, and the work of a lot of um, uh, Native American uh, feminists, it's in English, so why? I'm a philosopher, so in philosophy, that's the field where, to put it bluntly, the car is not taught in in area studies department, historian sort of philosophy department, but um, Native American philosophers are not taught in philosophy department, they're taught in area studies, right? So I have to go out of my own discipline in order to find why are philosoph Native American philosophers not being taught in philosophy department. Mm -hmm. We can discuss uh, why that is the case later, but I, I felt that it was particularly important and vital for this project uh, to adopt what Nelson Mandela Torres calls a decolonial attitude. So what I mean by decolonial, I mean the fact that you can't simply get rid of uh, or question the boundaries of why epistemologies you have inherited uh, all at once. It's not that we have read one or two books that question why they question the why epistemologies we are socializing, and then you've done your work. I think it's a, really an attitude that you have to cultivate. And always ask yourself, why am I reading and why am I interested in this line of thinking and not in this other line of thinking? Um, so it's a form of uh, um, epistemic insubordination that I thought was particularly vital for a feminist project because if the point is not simply to 
combat sexism, but also to address the, all the other forms of, of oppression at the same time, how could Eurocentrism or the coloniality of power uh, not also be part of this very process uh, of questioning? Okay, so um, the problem still remains, even adopting a, a, um, a decolonial attitude. For me, the problem still remains how to understand gendered bodies uh, within a philosophical framework that didn't create father hierarchy. I and mean, in particular, I'm sure you're all aware of how divisive it is within a feminist movement. Um, the opposition between trans inclusive and trans exclusive uh, feminists. <laughs> Beginning with in Jen, affirmation that womanhood is not a thing, but a relation, a social relation, um, I started to think of what would be the framework, the philosophical framework for uh, this project, the Black and Feminist Project. Um, and this is where what I call here the um, philosophy of trans individuality uh, came in. So the second part of the book is a long um, part uh, of discussion of what I call the philosoph philosophy of trans individuality. So the aim of the philosophy of trans individuality um, is not just to think of how to conceptualize uh, processes of gendering outside of uh, the heteronormative matrix, but also how to think of feminism outside of the anthropocentric framework that um, limits reproduction only to the ambit of the making of babies mm, or the making of the capitalist relation itself. Uh, and how can we think reproduction as a making of the capitalist relation itself uh, by including the more than human. So that was uh, uh, also part of the question. Uh, following insights from uh, uh, the colonial philosopher Sylvia Winter, and in particular uh, her essay on the overrepresentation of men, for me the question was what is the sort of philosophical framework that has actually led to this overrepresentation of man as what she calls a bourgeois ethnoclass? Um, and uh, um, Celia Winter points to the dogma of the non-homogeneity of substance. What is the dogma of non-homogeneity of substance is what in philosophy called uh, body-mind dualism. And why that is particularly important? Because Western metaphysics ever since Aristotle has been dominated uh, by this idea of a great chain of beings, so, you know, the Aristotelian idea that man uh, is superior to woman, is superior to enslaved people, is superior to animal, is superior to inanimate matter. Now, this uh, um, scala nature, you know, that's the Latin term which was known in, uh, uh, during the Middle Ages and early modern period, um, also translatable as the idea of a, a great chain of being, assign being ontological value according to how much they resemble what is the top. Uh, that's what Sylvia Winter uh, means by the overrepresentation of man. She doesn't mean simply the fact that cis men are overrepresented in politics, which by the way may also be the truth, but the but by the fact that. It's men because they were considered to possess the logos, the rational capacity for thinking and autonomy in its fullest uh, uh, capacity from Aristotle onwards, were considered to be the top of uh, the scala nature. And you can see here how the scala nature is actually predicated on uh, the possession of what we can call the mind. Or in other terms, the mind or the soul or uh, call it whatever you want that we, from our, or the logos that from man was progressively extended to woman and then to enslaved people. Uh, but still, this question as to whether it's uh, uh, possessed also by animals and animate matter, right? So there is this mind-body dualism 
that actually underpins this ontological hierarchy. And this is what Sylvia Winter means by the dogma of the non-homogeneity of substance. So what did I do with the philosophy of trans-individuality? So it's a philosophy that I, I developed by engaging with uh, um, Spinoza's uh, philosophy on one hand, but also the feminist materialism. Uh, like your very own uh, Karl Barat um, and other um, materialist feminists uh, in the second part of the book. And that enables me to question two things. First of all, the, this uh, uh, idea of an ontological hierarchy predicated on the body-mind dualism. And secondly, the idea of the underlying methodological individualism. That's uh, the more philosophical part of the book. So what is um, methodological individualism is the idea that being is in the first place a really individuated being. And most of uh, Western metaphysics is, uses logic, right? And uses the idea that whenever you say a chair or a uh, Massimiliano Tomba, you're talking about an individual, right? What the philosophy of trans individuality does is to question that individuality being is the starting point of philosophizing. And to summarize a, a very complex uh, philosophical move, move, it basically argues that there's not such a thing as individuals. We have never been individuals. Um, first of all, we are not objects or substances, but we are processes. Everybody is a process. So the relation comes before. Hmm? Um, the two move, we are processes and the relations comes, comes before the relator. So the relations comes before the objects uh, themselves. How, what does it mean this in particular and uh, when applied to single individual beings like this bottle of water, or Massimiliano Tomba in, in particular. Okay. It means that instead of looking at individuals as discrete beings that are really given, you look at them as processes. So philosophy becomes ontogenesis, becomes an analysis of the way in which we individualize. Mm -hmm. So the question is not so much what do we are as individuals, but how do we individualize? And the answer of uh, uh, that. The answer is to say that we individualize through process of becoming that imply the inter-individual level, so the interaction between two bodies, but also the supra-individual level, how uh, the networks that are uh, global, uh, at least if not even cosmic, impact our own individualizing, but also the infra-individual level. Okay? Think of the food we eat the air we breathe, I mean, the uh, bacteria that inhabit our body, or the hormones, the molecules that some people may take to transition. Mm -hmm. I use for this philosophy of trans-individuality a term Balibar interpretation of Spinoza. Balibar, uh, many folks of Spinoza, Balibar extend this philosophy of trans-individuality to Marx and Freud. But I should also say that, um, for instance, there's a, a very interesting um, um, Native American philosopher, um, T.E. Cordova, who um, was the first uh, uh, Native American woman, according to PhD, in this, in this country in philosophy. Uh, and she wrote a brilliant dissertation on uh, comparing Spinoza's Moniz philosophy of trans individuality with. Uh, uh, Navajo metaphysics, arguing that in Native American thinking you find exactly the same uh, philosophy of trans individuality, meaning you find the same two ideas combined that beings are not individuated beings but processes, and then the relations comes before uh, the object itself. Out uh, that connection, but this just to say that 
The two I come from, so I use Spinoza to develop this form of um, trans individual philosophy, but there may be also other uh, sources, and I don't want to uh, let them out. Okay, so what is the consequence of this move uh, from uh, um, uh, individuality to trans individuality? Uh, the consequence is that, first of all, we can use the notion of a gendered body outside of uh, the heteronormative and cisnormative framework, because if we're all processes and if we all individualize ourselves uh, through this network of relations at different level, then I individualize as a cisgender woman by accepting the gender was the son at birth, and somebody else can individualize as a woman by transitioning and taking hormones. I mean, these are just two different ways of becoming women, but it's not that there's an ontological hierarchy between the more real or the rest real uh, women. Secondly, there's no opposition between sex as something that is bodily given and gender as something that is socially constructed. Um, gender bodies are, as Paul and Jeremy say, social relations uh, from uh, uh, the very start. Um, but this also implies, in my view, that um, because you include the environment as not something that is separated from the process of becoming individualized, but in a way, literally, the environment is us. Uh, this form of uh, philosophy of trans individuality also uh, immediately transform what we could call ecofeminism into a um, form of queer ecology. Mm. Why? Well, because it questions uh, not just the methodological individualism, but also the hierarchy that uh, has separated, we have united from Western metaphysics of man being on top of woman, being on top of the slave people, on top of animal, on top of inanimate matter, which I take uh, the questioning of hierarchies, uh, and in particular the heteronormative hierarchies, I take to be at the center of what queer theory uh, is trying to do. So, in sum, I would say that uh, what uh, this uh, philosophy of trans individuality depicts is uh, um, what, with an expression by Paul Krishad, that we can call a form of somatic communism. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by somatic communism? Somatic communism is not yet yeah, political communism, but I think it's not by chance that so many people doing the philosophy of trans individuality actually come from Marxism and the communist uh, strand. But by somatic communism, I mean the idea that uh, life is so interconnected and even uh, um, not just uh, between humans, but also with the more than human. So we become individuals, not despite the others, but we become individuals through our own relations with the others. And these others include not just other humans, but also the more than human uh, in, in a deeply, um, and this is my view, in a deeply felt uh, philosophical, philosophical way. And we can go here for the circle and go back to anarcho feminism. So, how is this connected with anarcho feminism? You will remember from the beginning what is anarcho feminism is the idea that you cannot fight one form of domination without fighting on the others. That's what I said. It may appear as a contradiction to say that there's something specific in sexism and that you cannot fight sexism without fighting all the other forms of domination. Here we have an ontological explanation of why that is the case, because there is not such a thing as an individuality which is not at the very same time a form of trans individuality, meaning a process of individualizing as a single being that is intimately connected uh, with the web of life uh, around it, okay? So in that sense, I, and I take this from Spinoza, um, I argue that every being is to a certain degree animate, which doesn't mean animism, doesn't mean that every being is animate in the same way in which um, I am animate, right? It's a different uh, understanding of animation, but I also mean, um, what Emma, I learned from explicitly Emma Goldman and uh, Ho Jen, so the idea that 
Emma Goldman defined anarchism as the teacher of the unity of life. Poin Jen, taking Taoist philosophy, argues that also um, anarchism is the teacher of the unity of life. I mean, what does it mean? It means to say what it defined in Kropotkin and Bakunin, the idea, or in Gandhi for that matter, the idea that freedom is indivisible. Hmm? So what does it mean that freedom is divisible? It means that precisely because we are all imbued in this form of somatic communism, you cannot disentangle, uh, address one form of oppression without addressing all the other forms of oppression. Now, this obviously, to conclude, I mean, politically speaking, this doesn't mean that, that you have to fight all forms of oppression at the same time in the same battle. Mm -hmm. uh, I use this metaphor that I borrow from Audre Lorde and uh, Hilary Lazar. Audre Lorde says, all forms of oppression inhabit the same house of domination. Mm -hmm. Sexism, the idea that some sexes are superior to others. Uh, racism, the idea that some races are superior to others. Speciesism, the idea that some species are superior to others. Now, what all these forms of domination have in common is that they all inhabit the idea that some beings, this one in Western metaphysics, are superior to others. Hmm. On the Lord, famous sentence, you cannot fight the master house with the master tool. It's precisely to say you cannot fight one single form of domination, meaning sexism, unless you look at the whole house of domination and now different forms of oppression reinforce each other because they reinforce the idea that some people are superior to others and therefore entitled to dominate others, okay? Do you see here how the two things go together? Unity of life, somatic communism, anarcho-feminism, the idea that you cannot find what form of domination without fighting with others. Is that clear? Yeah. Now, the matter of the tangled knot says something else. It says that obviously it doesn't mean you have to fight everything at the same time. It means that you have to fight every single threat each time. Today, uh, there, there is a one new um, you know, abortion right. Tomorrow is the, the Alaska drilling project. Uh, another day is Black Lives Matter. All these threats, okay, that may require urgent attention all the time, are nevertheless, should nevertheless keep together um, and uh, what, in, in attending to as part of the same house of domination. And so that's what an feminist is for me, not so much a blueprint for the future. So I'm not going to tell you what to do tomorrow, but it's a method. It's a method for keeping together uh, the, the, it's a theory of domination. If you want it, it's a method for keeping together um, fight against sexism with all the other uh, forms uh, of oppression. So to summarize, what is anarcho-feminism? First of all, it is what it's not. So it's not just an extension of privilege. It's a questioning of privilege uh, itself from, from uh, uh, its, its very basis. Um, Clearly, for me, that, that was the, the, the sense of the project. Feminism is not just a question of women's issue. It's a, it's a much broader project. Uh, the book it began as a book on feminism and ended up with queer ecology. So a, the general critique of uh, the very uh, Western uh, metaphysic that I, certainly I have inherited uh, from uh, uh, my upbringing. But I also think it's, uh, it's important to point to this fact because, um, so if we look at the history of uh, um, the labor movement, um, I'm more familiar with the European history, but I'm sure it can be argued the same in general. The reason why workers um, gain what they gain in terms of workers' rights, uh, the eight hours a day, uh, labor day, uh, little pieces of socialism in Europe here, a bit less, uh, was because, not all, but a, a good amount of capitalists sided with the proletariats. 
For me, the problem of the feminist revolution is that not enough men, not enough cisgender men sided with feminism. And I see this all the time. Um, does not be to sum up, does not be the Karl Marx of feminism. Why do you say, well, why, why do you want Karl Marx of feminism? Well, I personally don't know a single man, uh, philosopher, was devoted an entire philosophical project to rethinking feminism or who have made of the feminist cause the fundamental uh, um, aim of their uh, philosophical project. Uh, and I think that's why there have been uh, advances in the critical faculty, but a persistence of monocracy and even a backlash, a monocratic uh, backlash. So man's choice is either go with the backlash and reactionary, um, just silence, not taking side, which is being complicit with the persistent man privilege, or take up the anarcho feminist banner. So choice <laughs> is yours. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very excited and unfortunately had to leave. So I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, thank you for that. And I look forward to reading more of your work. Um, I was intrigued by two things, and perhaps you, you said them and I didn't quite hear what you meant. Is one is I was curious to learn a little bit more about what theory of the state you're working with. And I'm I work, I'm I'm in the feminist studies department, I work in the Global South and Anarcho-feminism, I've talked about anarcho-feminism in the 70s and 80s in South Asia, the failure of the state is what made anarcho-feminism a really viable project right. for the left. So I was interested in what, and it wasn't the theory of the state yeah. vis-a-vis Marx, it was yeah. the theory of the state that was social contract divine theory. So I was very interested in what, what theory of the state, not a solitary one, but what kind of, to use Emma Goldman, intuitive um, sort of, uh, Theory of the state you were working yeah. with. And then the second question, if I may, is connected yeah. to the first, is I wanted to understand in this tangled knot of domination that you're, I think, calling us to think with quite persuasively, what is the ecosystem of value? Is this a non-competitive knot? Meaning, um, you know, we work in regimes of solidarity, right. but there's always uneven um, value systems attached right. to how we form those knots, right? right? And you yourself invoked certain Black Lives Matter, I would say Dalit Lives Matter, you know, whatever. So I want to hear a little bit more about, and they're both connected in terms yes. of, so whatever you plan, thank you. Okay, so uh, I was looking for a pen so I could take notes. Well, yeah. you can keep yeah. this. Well, no, I'm sorry. No, I already have many that's with me. Okay. Oh, okay. sorry. So, uh, okay, so, so uh, Okay, the, the question of um, the theory of the state. So, um, the start, and it's a long uh, answer, but say the starting point is that we live in a current system where basically every part of the globe is occupied by a sovereign state. Okay, the current system of sovereign state. Uh, we tend to think it's you know it's in 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 you can't escape from it because that literally there's no other place where to go unless you are stateless. Um, but the point is, it's a relatively recent phenomena because the Westphalian system of sovereign state remained limited to Europe. It's said to have begun in 1648. It actually was limited to Europe until decolonization. So the theory I'm looking at is uh, um, the state as a, actually it's in, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a political form that for me was born in uh, Europe uh, in um, um, during modernity and has been exported largely through uh, colonization to the rest of Europe, but has become now the hegemonic and unquestioned form of political organization. So I combine, if you want, the uh, critique of the state uh, you know, from the Marxist and anarchist uh, tradition as an instrument for the domination of the bourgeoisie with uh, uh, the uh, post-colonial and decolonial critique of the state as actually a form of domination that is imbued with uh, uh, Western imperialism. 
the density of, of the state I'm working with. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the value system I'm working with, I mean, um, if I get your answer correctly, to emphasize the, the unity of life uh, doesn't mean to say they were all cooperative. Uh, actually, in the Tina Spinoza is a thinker of conflict. Uh, it's not that because we life is so interconnected that we're just cooperative. I mean, there is the part we're so imbued with capitalist ideology that we can only see competition. And we have become blind to the fact that no social life whatsoever would be available if people were, were constantly competing with each other. I mean, if I walk in the street, most of the time I don't get run over by cars, even if there are no people looking, um, right? So we have become blind to the amount of, uh, what can we call it, mutualism that is actually imbued in life in general, not just human life, but right? the reproduction of life in general. The point is, it's not a question of uh, discussing how much life is competition and how much of it is cooperation. It's both at the same time. The point is to say that it's is entangled. And I mean, it's not just entangled in the sense of uh, you have individualities that depend on each other once they are constituted. Entangled in terms of co-origination. We come into being not despite others, but through others, which in my sense include also the other than human. Does that? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a question from the online book. Oh, uh, I, I don't see it, but uh, um, please, please go ahead. Okay, I'll just ask it from here instead of unmuting my phone. Um, on men supporting women in the U.S. case, male members of the House and Senate voted to extend the vote to women via a constitutional amendment ratified in state-level legislatures in 1920. Are there other examples of men supporting women that come to mind or matter to you? Uh, well, I mean, there are a lot of exceptions. <laughs> it's not the rule. I mean, I still... Uh, uh, for me, like uh, in New York City, right after uh, the abolition of uh, the Roe uh, versus Wade regime, so, you know, study abortion rights, which we all thought, okay, no, we, that happened in 1970s, we're not going to go back to that. Uh, there were so many people in, in the squares, but they were all second sexes. So women, uh, two-spirit people, um, third gender, LGBTQ plus people, there weren't that many cis men. I mean, all those I talked to in my own institution, the new school, they were all saying, well, you know, now there are the elections, and then uh, if the election goes well, uh, then uh, abortion will be solved, right? And for me, that's the problem of feminism. Um, we can discuss whether it's <laughs> Uh, the fault of feminist theorizing, or, or just, um, uh, I mean, I think is the lack. This is what I learned from Latin American feminists. I travel a lot with this project in Latin America. That's what I know from uh, Nuna Menas in Argentina, in Brazil. The problem is that uh, whereas a lot of uh, feminist movement in the US, but Europe is the same, fail to put together and aggregate uh, women's issues like abortion rights with other ones, what they managed to do in Latin America is to present abortion as a class issue, because wealthy women, they always manage to get abortion, a race issue, because it's indigenous women who can't get abortion, and as with this notion of the body territory, which is very strong in, um, uh, ecological movement in Latin America as an ecological issue, right? As a question of the control of the body. There things get more complicated because there are actually some uh, eco-feminist uh, territorial uh, movements um, that are against abortion, but that's why they've managed to bring people in the millions in the street. And that's why here, uh, there are moments of aggregation, that's what I see in the feminist movement, the moment of eruption and aggregation, very often uh, um, focus on, uh, oh, uh, Roe versus Wade, 
June last year, but then that's it, finished, right? And that, I mean, in New York, I'm not sure how is the situation here, but in New York, there are currently five different groups that are working on the uh, uh, abortion issues. Uh, so, and they're all incredibly divided with one another. Uh, that's the problem. For me, that's why the, the, whatever has happened with the feminist revolution, which I think it was a revolution, has been incredibly important, but it has a limit. Ma, and then Okay, I'll keep on. Okay, after the state, um, Oh, sorry. So, so what about what about property is the question? So what is this thing you address in your book? I haven't read it yet. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, one can say that uh, this binary mind and body can also be you know, can also be thought in terms of a will think. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and is the the dualism, the tension between the individual will and the thing that you can get. Then what is even more interesting is that if you go if you go back in history, this is a kind of a dualism that was uh, generated in the debate on poverty. Basically, the Franciscans they started thinking in terms of a domination of the body because they wanted they wanted to disentangle will from the the, the 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 complexity of the social web uh of a, of a, of, a, of a, if you want of a atomistic understanding of reality so, so it's not the case to make things too complicated and too historical so the, the, the question is basically you know what what do we do? What, what do we do with the property when yeah. we uh, uh, in a certain way we reproduce <laughs> relations all the time, you know, when you know, we own a house, or we buy, we pay taxes, or we pay a parking permit, and so on. So, and, 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 and my point is that in, in, in this legal structure of a property relations is, in a certain way, is the source of so many of these uh, 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 dualistic opposition. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to say that uh, this is the basis and mind and body is the superstructure, but uh, but uh, but they they work together, uh, um, and and so basically, so in one word, my question is uh, when we have to question uh, the many forms of uh, domination, how can we address the form of a domination that we reproduce all the time in our everyday life? And that is property. In every single transaction, we reproduce property. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I don't have a full answer because uh, <laughs> I can't do everything. <laughs> but uh, this is certainly something that um, I'd like to explore more. So uh, I'm intrigued by your connecting property to the body-mind dualism. That's not some work that I've done. And if you have other suggestions for reading, I'd be happy to uh, continue that line of thinking. The line of thinking I pursue in the book is the connection between uh, individual property and uh, the state's sovereignty as a uh, uh, colonial property. Right, so the institute of private, the connection obviously between the institution of private property and uh, uh, the reproduction, not simply of the capitalist distinction between production and reproduction, but the reproduction of uh, the capitalist relation itself, which is so entrenched in the notion of property. Um, another thing that I did was uh, the um, by engaging in particular with uh, um, Oyoronkyo Iwumi and the, the critique of uh, white feminism from the perspective of African uh, uh, feminism is uh, to disentangle property from uh, uh, the family. Now, what, what is the Oyoronkyo uh, argument? Oyoronkyo is that 
in the, the uh, mononuclear bourgeois family, which is strictly connected with the emergence of private property as the uh, default mode of organization of a society, as the nucleus of society, you can separate gender from race and class because usually in, uh, in the European mononuclear family, um, race and class are not evidently split. Mm -hmm. They are uh, class and racially homogeneous. But she argues when you apply this to African society, you get the completely wrong picture because you cannot separate gender from race and class. And she made the argument for the Oyo Yoruba societies, um, and in particular for uh, the um, the very distinction between Okunrin and Obinrin, what we will translate as male and female, for the females to be inferiorized as females and knowing that females didn't mean those who didn't have a penis because it could be a female and have a penis, so the biological uh, structure is completely different. For them, colonization meant at the same time being inferiorized as female, because they were excluded from the circuit of wage labor, which was largely reserved to men who worked within uh, um, the wage labor system. So since women were mainly in charge of uh, um, the um, care of the household and attending uh, uh, the needs of uh, uh, the reproduction of the family, but excluded from the wage labor circuit, for them, gender and class exploitation and racial exploitation because they were also perceived as uh, the uh, indigenous versus the elite of uh, the white women. For them, you can't separate gender, race, and class. They're all one and the same thing. And so she comes up with this idea that is also then later reinforced by um, Maria Lugones theory of the coloniality of gender that the gender binarism, the way in which Western feminism think about feminism as a question linked to the family is highly misleading because it works with this binary men, women and questioning the binary, but it's actually a fourfold at least uh, hierarchy because you have um, white uh, colonizers, um, males, uh, white um, females, and then you have uh, the colonized men, and at the very bottom, the colonized females. Um, and their argument is to say that the problem with white feminism is that it brings with it the institute of private property each time it um, conceptualizes the family. So it understands the family in terms of the family household and its private property. And that simply doesn't work for Africa, where marriages are not about gender. They're about clan uh, and they're just structured uh, in a different way. So just one question. I have done that work on the body mind dualism. The book made me for active property in terms of uh, the connection between private property, the capitalist mode of production, uh, the sovereign state system and colonialism. Thanks. Not the whole work, but a lot, <laughs> I can say. Thanks. Oh, yeah, very good question. Um, what can you say more about this different difference between patriarchy and democracy? Right. And uh, like the need to come up with this new concept, like what concrete reality is this new concept trying to Explain well, it's mainly trying to explain why, even in context where patriarchy is questioned, mm -hmm. where, where men are no longer the patriarchs, the single head of the family, why is male privilege continuing? I mean, continuing the male privilege is pretty evident globally. globally. Um, there's something like 126 million missing girls from the global population. I mean, just as a consequence of sex selective abortion, inequalities of care, um, 126 missing girls. That's the number of gender violence. And some people say it's not 126, it's 120, others say it's 140. 
but I mean, these are the numbers. I mean, gender violence attacks mainly women and gender non-conforming people. That's a fact. So that for me is a form of continuity, including in places where Patrick is questioned, okay? So for me, the question is, if we re remain attached to the notion of patriarchy, we become blind to this persistence of male privilege, gender violence, gender pay gap. I mean, women are routinely paid 63% of what men are paid for the same job. How do we want to conceptualize it? It's not just patriarchy because uh, um, women often actually run the whole family because they do both care work and uh, wage um, productive work. And they often uh, do have a power, the power that comes with that, but there's still this pay gap, right? Uh, I mean, these are just examples of the continuation of male privilege. Here is the point. There are contexts where I think one can rightly speak about neopatriarchy. For instance, I'm not an expert of Saudi Arabia, but in the case of Saudi Arabia, there's a number of studies that talk about neopatriarchy uh, because the figure of the patriarch is still very uh, powerful. Um, because of the system of women tutelage. So it's uh, the man, either the father or a male uh, in the family, the brother, who has to authorize women to work, to travel, to make marriage arrangement, and so on and so forth. That for me is a clear case of neopatriarchy or patriarchy to poor. How do we define other forms of continuation of male privilege? even in context where there's a formal equality of rights. I don't like my dogs, it's fine. Just give me another turn. But I think uh, um, we, we need other concepts because otherwise uh, we are stuck in, uh, uh, in the fact that we're not, I mean, concept and monominalist concepts are useful to make visible um, certain reality. And then for me, what this notion of democracy did was to make this, this, this reality. I have to say, this book came out in uh, 2022, at the you know, end of 2021, it was translated in uh, three, four languages. And uh, this notion of uh, monocracy and the second sexes is one of the notions that I think attracted most attention. Now, in it didn't happen with any of my book that they got translated in so many languages so quickly. And I think it's because this book is the result of desperation. <laughs> and they're not the only desperate outside there. I mean, I think there's a, a widespread sense of being stuck there in this position where there's an alleged, I mean, I don't live in Saudi Arabia, otherwise I would be saying, okay, there's just no formal equality of rights, but there is an alleged equality, always incomplete because the law is always incomplete in that sense, but there's an alleged formal equality and we're still far from experiencing it. So how do we conceptualize? Thank you. Key, I'm going to put you on cue. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, so my, my question is, um, what happens to the, the subject in all of this? I, I know this, this might seem like a terminological question, but I, and I think there's some really good reasons for avoiding the subject altogether. Um, and maybe this is part of the move away from the Eurocentrism. Uh, but I'm just wondering what the, the political and philosophical stakes are of, of going towards you know, trans individuality rather than something like inner subjectivity. And, and I realize that uh, there are specific intellectual genealogies here, like you're, you're going to Balabar or back to Spinoza rather than going to like phenomenology or something like that. But um, I just, I wonder uh, if the subject or something like the subject, and so maybe some non-monism or like in technical terms, like a decision or something is, in some sense necessary in order to um, make this unity of life or relationality amenable to critique 
and practice. Right. Uh, I know this is an old question, but I, I just I I wonder how you avoid um, the danger of this relationality collapsing into kind of like an automatic self naturalizing right. vitalist principle, right? Um, and do you need something like uh, you know rather than just somatic communism, like a body subject communism, like a right. inner right. inner body subject communism? And I don't think that anarcho feminism would be in a really privileged position to right. develop this in a way that someone like you know, but you cannot. <laughs> um, so yeah. No, thank you so much for the question. Actually, um, yeah, it gave me a really a great chance to clarify some positions. So. <clears throat> the use of the subject, I mean, they are um, the conference tradition that is very humanist and uh, anthropocentric, and there's nothing wrong with that in principle. Um, it can lead to easy, can easily be combined with theories of intersubjectivity, whereas it's the Hegelian tradition or, um, you know, uh, mid interactionism. That's very easy to do, right? Uh, when you, to go from one individual subject to multiple individual subjects interacting together, creating a society, that's uh, basically 80% of what contemporary, uh, what 80, 90% right? of what contemporary uh, political philosophy is about. The point is, in all this, although it, there's a connection between uh, philosophy of uh, trans individuality and theories of intersubjectivity, most theories of intersubjectivity are inter subjects, right? They don't look at what happens infra subjects, they don't look at what happens inside of the body. And that's what interests me because that's what connects us to the air we breathe and therefore to the global ecosystem, right? When, uh, um, when we say that we are the forest, I really mean we are the forest <laughs> because in a way, the cycles of life connect us all, all on the same boat. Mm -hmm. So for me, looking at what happens at the infra-individual body, the toxins that are deposited in our bodies, how certain countries are more prone to be saturated with toxic waste than others. And you can see how this is inseparable from uh, a biopolitical and racist regimes, right? You know, Italian uh, um, gets to dump their toxic waste in Lebanon. Why is that possible? You know? Um, but for me, what is interesting is that those toxic waste the deposit in your guts literally connect you to global biopolitical regimes and to the cycle of life across the planet, right? So this is why I move away from inter-subjects, inter-subjectivity towards the philosophy of trans-individuality which is not what a lot of queer theory has been doing, uh, you know, the, for instance, Tim Morton and the other mesh, which is like this cow where, um, you know, uh, Hegel would say the night where all cows equally look great. For me, the problem there is that that kind of uh, queer ecology is not only uh, philosophically weak, you know, the night that we're uh, all cows equally look great, but it's also very problematic because this idea that we are all open and open forever, all part of the same mesh, it's a free pass on uh, those who can abuse queer people, right? We're not open forever, I'm not open forever. Um, what do I mean by this? I mean that what the notion of trans individuality does is not to say that we're not individuals. It's not to say that I'm not responsible for my action. It's only saying that as an individuality, I come into being through this trans individual network. Okay, so you can't separate my own individuality from the general somatic communism uh, that makes up the webs of life. But the advantage of uh, this theory of a trans individuality in comparison to other forms of uh, um, queer ecology is that it retains the notion of individuality. I mean, uh, not in the sense of the Western um, 
individualism, you know, the idea that we're separated atoms, uh, but in a sense that I believe is meaningful enough uh, to support for instance, the idea of responsibility. Thanks. Kyle, your turn. No, oh, thanks. Thanks for that and for breaking down a lot of things that people don't usually break down. Um, I have so many questions. Half of them will be from the QA so far. Um, and one thing, just in relation to your answer just now, what I wasn't getting is that um, you're interested in hanging on to the individual because of wanting to assign to the individual responsible agencies. Right. Um, and I just wonder if you can hang on to that if you really do your analysis, because I'm not sure you can. Um, I mean, I think responsibility is also a trans individual concept. Yeah. Um, but so the first question, I, I, I mean, not question, comment I wanted to make is, it seems like the problem is um, epistemological as much as anything else, yeah. because uh, getting there entirely depends on the end analysis, right? Um, and that's got me stuck because I'm like, yeah, I can't see, mm, I can't see the conceptual undoing that would be required to get there. Right. Um, uh, and you might have answered it when Anjali asked. I'm not sure I heard, but why start with feminism? I, I wondered about that. I mean, sometimes I think, why not start with the beyond the human? Because um, it seems to be the thing that's not getting enough um, play in epistemological, conceptual, and philosophical arguments. Um, and then uh, I wondered, in terms of starting with feminism and in terms of responsible agents, if human liberation is the goal here. Um, because what if we took human liberation out of the picture as the goal of this um, effort? So those were <laughs> Yeah, I know. No. Oh, and when you said the thing about relationality and subjectivity in the subject, one thing I did want to say is psychoanalysis has always held yeah. that first is relation, right? And that the entire life of what we call individual humans is spent attempting to individualize yes. from relationality. Um, and it's still sometimes a useful thing to remember because subjectivity never finally comes into being, right? Yeah. There's never a subject. It's always a process in some of the same ways you've been talking about. Yes, no, thank you so much uh, for, for your comment. I think we have so many interesting comments. Let me just begin with a, a brief remark on psychoanalysis, which is you know, one of the fields I've been working with. I didn't get into the second part in here, so it just was in space. I, I totally agree with you. And it's not by chance that, whereas uh, uh, this notion of your conscious being individual or collective, Lacan clearly said that your conscious is trans individual. He said it in a footnote. Yeah. <laughs> but I think. Uh, being a body of conscious is very appropriate. I mean, all the, you know, footnote to the agree is this is that their conscious is not an individual or collective, it's trans individual. And uh, I take that as a hint um, for saying that what I've been trying to argue, I mean, in this book through Spinoza and more ontological argument, is the same thing that actually Sakanaz has been saying. And that's what Etienne Malibar argues when he puts together. Um, Spinoza, Marx, and Freud as thinkers of the trans individuality. Okay. Um, so why um, why beginning with feminism, not just with the beyond the human? I mean, for me, it was even more powerful to argue that you cannot achieve human liberation without the liberation of the more than human. 
then to begin with uh, the more than human and argue we need to liberate the more than human on its own term, right? Precisely because um, of, of the unity of life, I think it's absolutely central to emphasize that it's just one liberation. I mean, when I, the motto of the, the book is that either all or none of us are going to be free. I really mean all, you know, I really mean uh, all life form, um, all the planet, uh, it will be free or just not going to be free. I mean, none of us is probably even going to be. So for me, it was important to begin with this and we could say, you know, why feminism, uh, why are you not beginning with uh, racism? Uh, and sure, I mean, uh, who am I to say uh, to those who militate in uh, Black Lives Matter? No, you have to put feminism first. If your fear is that your son tomorrow is going to go out and get shot, or as it happened two weeks ago, take the metro and just get a, a chokehold just because you start to scream a memory and then there's a white. Uh, Marine who comes out and just kills you. One to say to them, oh no, you have to put feminism first, right? But what I, I want to say is we do live in a global democratic regime. I mean, uh, I'm not saying that this is the only starting point, but it's an important piece of the undoing of mechanism of domination. And in the piece of the undoing of the mechanism of domination that gets under the carpet and that then almost never gets the full attention of fun. Yeah. So that's why I'm insisting on fatness. Mm -hmm. uh, we can say the more than human is the same, I agree, but why not putting them together? Yeah. Um, so for me, that was really the sense of the project. Instead of doing, okay, we do ecology here, and then we do feminism there, like, are they the same thing? Are we in both cases, and I, I'm sure this is not the entire conceptual I'm doing, but like if we are do this hierarchy here and the methodological individualism that presupposes it, I think we do a bit of undoing. Maybe it's not the whole undoing in terms of the conceptual work that is needed, but we do a big chunk of it. Um, and so in that sense, yeah, totally agree. It's, it's an epistemological question of much of the analysis uh, going on. Um, so the question of responsible agency, it is a trans-individual question, yes, I agree. But because it is a trans-individual question, I, I take it as to be a method, right? So when you are analyzing issues of responsibility, you look not simply at the boundaries of a single individual body, right? But also how the body is socialized in certain regimes that, you know, these three, at least these three here, uh, and how the individualizing within them leads to certain actions. Um, I don't see, I'm not ready to give up on the notion of responsibility just because it's very useful and <laughs> I mean, uh, very useful for, for social life to be able to say, well, I understand you are on the metro and there's a, a white guy, uh, you know, um, there's a white guy sitting there, there's a, a black guy who's screaming on the New York City metro system that he's hungry and you get scared. But the, and I understand that you are scared, but this doesn't justify you to kill me in an eight second uh, chokehold. So you're still responsible, even though clearly the racist regimes in which you've been uh, uh, socialized leads you to perceive a black guy more of a threat as if he had been a white guy screaming and angry. Uh, clearly, this action is also the result, the result of being a marine. And so having learned that move that in an eight second, you can kill anybody. If it had been uh, me, who have never been in the Marines, and I'm a woman, I could not, you know, I would not go in the Marines, but also the woman, that's not the first thing you would think. It would, I would not even be physically trained in, okay, you know, here, it's, it's a boy's thing. Right? 
So this philosophy of trans individuality will enable you to look, okay, there's a, a white guy who just killed a black guy because he was screaming on the metro and hungry. Can we say that he's not responsible for the action? No, it's responsible. But with in this trans individual philosophy framework, these are all the other things I would look at. Um, you know, the family, the family's lens, the biopolitical racist regimes, uh, yeah, the, and the species as well. I mean, this idea that uh, masculinity is uh, immediately action. And so if there's somebody screaming, why would the first action be to give him a chokehold and prevent him from breathing, you know? Can't you just try to talk or engage in some other ways? So on this thing, but with your permission, I want to just insert myself here because I want to ask a follow-up question right. and to play the devil's advocate a little bit. What is the liberation of more than human? I I, I ask this because if you know you portrayed a very almost utopian construction where the liberation of one is tied to the liberation of all. And, and the all includes not just the rest of humanity, but yeah. everything. And I mean, we just came out of a pandemic, right? Where clearly the liberation of the virus was in diametrically opposed terms to my <laughs> liberty. <laughs> so I find it really difficult to conceptualize a regime where everybody's liberation works together. Right. So, like, can you elaborate? Because, because, like, I'm thinking from within a system where, given relations of domination among humans, the liberation of one does not uh, depend. I mean, the, the liberation of all does not depend on the liberation of one. To right. the contrary, they are usually in antagonistic terms, but. I take a leap of faith and I can imagine a universal conception among humans. What I find difficult to do is to imagine human liberation in tandem with yep. the liberation of the more than human. That's why I was asking that question. Yeah. About so, it. like, how does it, how do these all, like, well, work together? Yeah. So, first of all, uh, in terms of the planet, like, we are heading towards a critical threshold in terms of global warming, where, I mean, what I said, it's not, it's not just that either all or none of us will be free. It's like, either all or none of us will actually be. Because if we kind of breathe, we're just going to be extinct as a species. So in this sense, for me, I'm not, that, that's what the point where human liberation really, where a uh, threshold where it can't be separated from the more than human because uh, of global warming. And I, I take it to be um, that we are a critical threshold. Uh, in that sense. So that's one example. But if you project this, for instance, if you combine this with um, a decolonial critique, like what Native American would tell you is that this is why anxiety, because we actually have experienced the catastrophe and the apocalypse already with 1492, like with the destruction of uh, entire populations. But what I also tell you is that the destruction of their own uh, um, population who had 99 with the destruction of the land, the connection with the land, the destruction of uh, uh, different uh, animal species, the destruction of plants, biodiversity. So from a specific experience that of uh, um, Native American critique of uh, the settler colonial enterprise to what I can perceive now as the most general human experience, global warming, I don't see what we have to gain in separating human liberation from uh, the liberation of the more than human. Again, this doesn't mean that um, everything is going to be nice. You know, and that every animal is going to be nice to us and every virus is great for us. Okay. First of all, the pandemic is a good example of the fact that, uh, had there not, I mean, there was a virus 
according to some studies, there was uh, um, were limited to animals for a very long time. Had they not been brought into the Chinese market uh, and uh, transmitted from the market to the human species, maybe those um, zoonotic leaps would not have happened. You know, it would have been so because also of uh, uh, the capitalist destruction of biodiversity and destruction of natural environments. We are going to be more and more prone to this destructive form of interspecies um, vulnerability. And for me, the, if the pandemic is an example of one thing, is precisely the fact that we can't just think that our um, liberation is inseparable from what happens to the bats in a, in a, some. Uh, you know, far away ecosystem. Because of uh, the circuit of capital, commodities, dead animals, living human beings constantly across the planet, we are more and more interconnected. So from the uh, biggest possible level of global warming to the more, to the level of circulation of commodities, I think we can't separate um, but, but, our relation from that of uh, uh, of the more than human. But interconnectedness is one thing. Liberation, which is a normative category, is another thing. Like, like how do you negotiate the fact that you can be ontologically interrelated, but the like liberation involves a vision. Uh, it's a it's a you know an emancipatory vision. Like, how do you how do you interrelate those visions? How do you even begin to articulate the liberation of the virus? Well, the liberation of the virus, first of all, is not to, I mean, in the case of the virus, I, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert of uh, um, viruses, but from what I just, okay, but from what I read is because the virus is a, a noontic virus. So it's a virus that leaked from animals to the humans. And that's what made it so lethal for humans, right? Okay. So the point is, if those animals' uh, habitats were not being destroyed, right, they would not come to be as uh, um, uh, lethal on humans as well. Okay, so that's how so you see your notion of liberation is linked to um, the humanist idea that liberation is okay. Here is the vision of the party liberation means end of capitalist exploitation, let's extend it, end of monocracy, end of democracy. No, let's extend it to all, all the others. So, how are dogs going to think about their liberation? How are the molecules of oxygen going to think about liberation? How is the ozone sphere going to think about its own liberation? And it implies vision, but by vision you mean a form of propositional thinking, which is already obviously an anthropomorphic projection. Sorry. Exactly, right. I mean, Maybe we don't need that, you know? Maybe we don't need to think that um, animals need to have uh, uh, those anthropomorphic um, types of vision, although we do know that animals can imagine, right? But we do know that uh, cetacean have a capacity to imagine, and it's quite complex, not in the sense of forming images, but also in the sense of creativity. And uh, even that, right? another part of the point is to undo this category of animal, because it's, uh, it groups so many different things. I mean, uh, cetaceans, or apes are so different from uh, uh, in, in, in simple types of animal that even just the category, I think it does more, it creates more problem uh, than uh, solving them. But for me, the overall point is that we just cannot separate them because uh, if we don't think of human liberation in connection with the liberation of the whole planet, we may just not be there. 
in a, a few centuries from now to even do this thing that seems like thick. <laughs> See what I mean? But thank you for indulging me. Sorry, Hannah. Yeah, I know we have a lot to talk about, clearly. <laughs> I, I had a different question, but I will do a follow-up on this. Okay. Too, <laughs> so if I take the I understand that our liberation depends on you know the planet and now we think, but I don't see like how the planet Earth depends on us. They would they would be perfectly fine if we extinct now. It would be there exactly. So, so how does that square with what you you're suggesting? Right. Well, it depends on us in the sense that it, um, first of all, it's I really love the idea of Anthropocene. I mean, I, I think we should call it the Capitalocene. But capitalism uh, is hurting the environment now, and it's actually in our power to stop at least some of the harm now. So in my view, yeah, fine, and it could go as extinct if, if we had never come into being, maybe for the Earth it would even be better. But we are here now where we have the choice between doing nothing between continuing uh, fracking and uh, um, uh, just production of uh, um, carbon dioxide and air pollutants, or stop that, right? We can choose between just uh, promoting a mode of production that is aimed at the increase of profit and capital at the expense of everything else. Or we can say, well, maybe this capitalist mode of production is actually not even benefiting the species. It's just benefiting the few capitalists who are, those who are gonna be able to have a safe landing uh, at least in the uh, short term, right? And we can just change that. I mean, capitalism is not inevitable. I mean, there are choices to be made. I mean, states are actually, although <laughs> a place to begin with, uh, for choices that can be made now. Yeah, but that, that, that's completely fine. Like, the question is, like, but we are doing it for selfish reasons. That's the thing. You know, like, if you're just going to okay. change the system and everything, that will be done again for okay. selfish reasons. So, the earth will be completely fine. Here, here, right? here, like, here, that's like, yeah. again, we are just like, for anthropomorphic. No, that, anthropomorphic no that's the whole account. point of uh, um, reconceptualizing, reconceptualizing ethics in, uh, for me, at least in a Spinoza's framework. It's just that there's no difference between egoism and altruism. I mean, uh, you take care of the other, including the other, uh, the human, and not because for altruistic reason or for egoistic um, reason, but because there's no distinction between egoism and altruism. Like if literally the other, the human, lives in my body, in my guts, in my stomach, then when I'm taking care of uh, uh, the plants that I eat, it's not that I'm doing it because I love basil. I love basil, but or I don't want to pollute the salad that I eat. It's because you can't separate the others from me. So the very distinction between altruism and egoism collapses and it actually most of Spinoza's scholarship describes Spinoza's ethics as a form of altruistic egoism or egoistic altruism, meaning that you can't separate them. I have Sean, Sadie, and I'll be John Lewis. Hi, this is very interesting. Thank you for the talk. Um, so, so, at the beginning, you mentioned how. Today, there's been a rise of authoritarianism. And it seems to me part of what's at stake in this distinction between patriarchy and monocracy is, is exactly the sort of like unevenness of you know, gender-based liberation and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, like people on the far right tend to focus very much on how they're losing something by certain forms of liberation that are occurring uh, for men, trans people, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just wondered if this was like 
more of a historical question in a certain way. I mean, you mentioned 1492 and anxiety. This made me think of uh, like uh, Neumann has this uh, article called Fear, or I'm sorry, no. Yeah, uh, Fear and Politics, or Anxiety and Politics. Um, where, like, one of the things that he writes is how um, authoritarianism is often a function of certain anxieties that get produced um, right. in societies. So, yeah, I was just curious if, if this is something because it wasn't clear to me that it wasn't clear to me whether or not you're you're making an implication out of um, the rise of certain forms of liberation with this sort of. Um, you know, reactive politics or reactionary politics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for the question. I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, I mean, it, it is this anxiety that is generated by the loss of privilege right? and the question and you know, what is this going to look like. Um, actually, um, Eva von Redeke has a very interesting analysis of. Uh, um, the global rise of uh, neo authoritarianism and what she calls the missing link syndrome. Like, because uh, men are experiencing uh, globally that a part of their privilege has gone missing, so they, there is this anxiety and this overreaction. That's why I speak, secondly, speaking about a uh, reactive formation, because, you know, it's like, not just patriarchs, but like Trump, you know, grabbed by the pussy. Um, not just uh, um, male, the continuation of male privilege, but caricature of much politics in Italy, Salvini, right? Um, so, yes, the answer. I had forgotten that article by Newman, uh, so I've got to go back and read it. So, sure. thank you for it. For the um, uh, reading suggestion, have to go back to. Um, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of not reproduction um, in biology, but in terms of the interconnectedness of the species, I wonder what role um, religion plays in your work, okay. if any. Um, because you know a lot, a lot of. Um, non-Christian religions really get into that. And I was wondering yeah. if you thought about that, thinking with it. Um, yeah. I yeah. have a second part, but it's gone, so. <laughs> All right, um, no, again, wow, wow. These questions are all oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for all of that. Um, this is a great question, also because the very distinction between, for instance, religion, philosophy, literature, is very often mapped on um, uh, the European experience. And so the, the distinction, uh, uh, for instance, in the case of Native American philosophies, because they are oral tradition and very much based on rituals um, and very much transmitted through rituals, you can hardly separate myth, storytelling, rituals uh, from philosophy itself. So that's clearly the case of the Navajo tradition that Cordova analyzes. But also another example, when I was discussing this with um, uh, some uh, Buddhist friends, they said, well, what you're talking about this is what we call Pratitya Samupada. It's besides the idea of interdependence as co-origination. I mean, even there, there's a question, is Buddhism a philosophy? Is it a religion? Uh, is one of the cases where I think the, like in the case of Native American philosophies, the opposition just makes it impossible for us to enter into the system. For us, I mean, as like myself, educating the European um, modern tradition, which is based on the separation between spheres. It's based on the, the idea that politics is different from economics. That's actually one of the effects of capitalism to separate them. Uh, philosophy is uh, this thing is separate from religion and this is from literature. You can't read Native American literature without being immersed in immediately in uh, uh, rituals, myth making, and philosophy is all one and the same thing, precisely because literature is not single individuals writing poems about their own 
innate feelings as separate from the entire traditions of um, storytelling. Right? So this is one of um, the examples of uh, uh, the way in which when you do um, adopt a decolonial attitude, you have to undo this category that you have in mind. Having said that, uh, I moved in the United States when I was really 35 years old. Uh, and uh, so most of my life and body is imbued with uh, um, separation between uh, religion and philosophy. Uh, and so, I mean, I do think that Spinoza's Deus Siva Natura is he's talking about Deus Siva Natura. So I think that this, this is the idea of the eternity of the mind that um, we pretend is not there, but it's actually in the text itself. And it's actually very close to Buddhist um, ideas about the eternity of the mind. But anyway, my approach is uh, one where I move with philosophical frameworks. Uh, I'm not enough conversant in the Native American philosophies to claim to be doing them. Clearly not conversant in Buddhist philosophy uh, as well. Uh, but I don't see why that should not play as a part um, in the uh, informal theorizing about um, forms of interconnection between species. Nicola, and then if there's time, I want to ask another question. Um, so as you know, I'm not an expert, so please forgive yeah. me if I am as to be misunderstanding. So please let me clarify the comment at the beginning of the question. So going to, for this interposition between the philosophy of transcendentality and this scala natura. Um, if I start on the scala natura, right? It's a hierarch hierarchical, vertical, yeah, like uh, structure. Uh, but this also offers, in some sense, a very clear way for how to tackle this, which is just, you know, that a woman does not behave anymore as a woman, so it's not, she's not going to uh, cook or tend to the babies or the snakes that's you know, uh, picking up the tomatoes and so on. Oh. And, and, you know, just pick up the layers below, and eventually the, the one on the top would be the first and last yeah. piece of the pyramid. Yeah. So in some sense, there's a very clear way how to go back this. Yeah. Now, so now going to this philosophy of transcendentalism, I want to ask you two things. First of all, is the philosophy itself of transcendentality your response to this hierarchical like scheme, or should we look for, or the point for me was if this is a new ontology, right? right? It should you should be able to find an image through which this liberation in some sense should occur. That is this right. processes from which you have the individuation of the beings that you say are perceived. Right. The beings themselves can be polarized, that they're not necessarily neutral, right? It can be polarized. That's the medium into which this individuality can come up. It's not necessarily homogeneous, and it actually is not, I would say, right? I mean it's doesn't mean only that California is different from I don't know, Italy or Morocco or whatever. Uh, but what I'm really asking is in this new philosophy of transcendentality, what would be in some sense the utopia that you look for? Because I would imagine that it's not an homogeneous medium, right. but rather a balance between different potential ones. That is, you know, if you have an excess, if we have nowadays an excess of uh, say male uh, um, individualities that come up, but male in the sense of like the carry on the privilege, uh, should we look for to just uh, let's say kill this potential that creates this, or rather you know make it small enough and balance it with something else? In the sense that you know if you want to take an ecological example, you do need fires are uh, can be completely destructive. But also play a role in ecological system because they actually, you know, it's part of the process. So in some sense, you know, wouldn't you need? I mean, this is maybe a bit provocative, but you know, it's maybe go to keep some fascists in the world just to remember what you're fighting against, you know, <laughs> rather than taking them all out. <laughs> well, it would. I'd rather do without the fascists. There were a lot of people you know, that. 
Trump was actually good so that we would know what the left would get more radical. It seemed to me all what happened thanks to Trump was that we lost abortion rights. <laughs> so I'm not uh, exactly um, intrigued by the idea that we need fascists so that we know where our fine names. For me, it's in, I mean, in terms of images, like I did my philosophical career with theories of imagination. So I'm a, and I also have a creative writing process uh, that is parallel to the philosophical one, um, where I do directly engage with uh, this question of what are the sort of images that can orient us. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, the image that can orient, uh, th this form of uh, philosophy of transcendentality, any image that give us sense of how interconnected we are. I mean, there's no doubt, for instance, that having been able to look at the planet Earth from afar, I mean, those first images of uh, the Earth as the, uh, um, you know, a spaceship, what is the term for, and there's a specific name for this image of uh, the Earth as a um, that was first taken uh, um, in I think sixties of the planet Earth as this uh, uh, you know um, one Earth later yeah the, you know just the planet just the fact that at some point humans were able to take a picture of the planet and perceived it as just one planet within uh, um, the universe. Right, as just one single thing, I think it's done, it had a huge impact on the birth of ecological movement in the 70s um, worldwide, right? And clearly, not by chance, in the last few years, uh, the slogan, There's No Planet B, uh, has been a, a rally cry for different forms of ecological movement uh, across the planet. With uh, in, in the last ten years, I think it's not my chance. And we assisted to the first uh, general climate strike, uh, literally happening in really different moments, but uh, for us to go. Um, so for me, we do need images are super important. Like I'm a politics of imagination person uh, and philosopher. Um, the image of the planet uh, from afar is one image to give you a sense of this uh, the unity. Now, what the philosophy of trans individuality implies, and particularly in its, in its version, is a form of ecocentric egalitarianism. I mean, is the idea that there's no ontological hierarchy. Now, this doesn't mean that. I am not different from this ball. It just means to assume that there's no ontological hierarchies uh, between us um, in the sense that, speaking, every being is a mode of the infinite unique substance, right? Um, now, here yeah, things get complicated. They say, well, I don't have to think that there's not a, an ontological difference between you and this ball, right? If I uh, try to kill you, you respond, and then if I destroy this ball, I'm not as persecutable as if I kill you, okay? Very bad, I seem to like images of struggles. To say that there's no ontological hierarchy, that we're all more of the same substance, that's why I like the idea of trans individuality. It doesn't mean that there's no differences and that there's no choices that we can make as a society between saying, okay, uh, that is all interconnected. Without water, there will not be Chiara Votici, but like uh, I am more liable uh, to get into trouble if I kill a Chiara than if I drink a bottle of water. <laughs> okay. So that's what a philosophy of trans individuality communicates. Now, the philosophical question, consciousness. What do we do with the fact that there are uh, individuals that have the capacity for propositional thinking and for suffering and for emotions, uh, which varies? I mean, not only between individuals, 
uh, humans, and some are more common, sorry, than others. But if you think about animals, there's a whole variety even within animals or plants with complex responses. This has generated what uh, philosophy of mind, in philosophy of mind is called the hard problem of consciousness. Now, here is a philosophical problem. So either you assume a form of body mind dualism, but then you get into the problem of explaining how outside of non-conscious uh, bodies, like this table, a plan, and then suddenly there's Chiara who writes book and as propositional thinking. Mm -hmm. So how do we go, it's called the hard problem of consciousness because it's not easy to solve. If you take metaphysical dualism, then you take the idea that all the humans are endowed with the mind and with the consciousness. Mm -hmm. This leads to endless problem. How do you conceptualize the relationship between the two? And most of all, how can you explain that somebody some kind of uh, materiality in the connection in your brain at some point generate propositional thinking. Mm -hmm. Spinoza's alternative, which is actually now very much of fashion in the neuroscience, with Sanford and Damasio has taken up this hypothesis as philosophically the most elegant, is actually much easier to presuppose that some form of consciousness, some form of thinking is inherent in every kind of matter. What does it mean? It means that even this bottle, this was what Spinoza would say, even this bottle think, I mean, the whole point of Spinoza is to say that the order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things, right? So every being says is to some degree animate. This doesn't mean that this baller can write books. It doesn't mean that a plant can write books. It doesn't, but it, what it means? Well, it means that different types of beings are animated in different ways. I mean, you can tell me about particle levels. I mean, I got a glimpse of it through Karen Barad's agential realism, but it means that let's say the atoms that keep together the chemical composition of this uh, bottle, this as far as Spinoza could go in the, in the 17th century, are a form of uh, animation form that keeps together um, the individual bodies that compose this bottle of water, okay? Every being, Spinoza says, is endowed with its conatus, with its attempt to persist in its being. Now, clearly, this bottle is trying to persist in its being through the chemical bonds that keep it together, through its physical presence, through the fact that if I throw this oops at you, <laughs> I'm probably gonna hit you, right? So that's its conatus. But if your conatus takes the form of wanting to destroy this bottle, then your conatus destroys these bottles, right? Your attempt to persist, let's say, is a can lead to the destruction of this ball. But this doesn't mean that not every form of being is endowed with some form of conatus, with some form of attempt to persist in its own being. And it's not as very clear, attempt to persist in, in its own being, quantum means to esse, meaning in as far as it connects to this being. This bottle is not trying to write anarcho-feminism books. It's just trying to persist in its name as a bottle, okay? Uh, but what are the advantages of thinking that this bottle is to a certain degree animate? Which again, is not a form of animism. It doesn't mean that this bottle is gonna speak at night, okay? Spinoza is very critical of animism and spiritism and that kind of thing. It means that, philosophically speaking, it's a much more elegant solution uh, than assuming that consciousness suddenly appears only in certain type of materiality. There's no explanation in neuroscience of how you can get conscious thinking out of non-conscious matter. That's 
the heart problem of consciousness. So Spinoza's philosophical framework actually helped us to solve that philosophical issue. I know how he's thinking silent because it's much easier to presuppose that some form of thinking is present in every materiality, and then it can get more and more complex as the materiality becomes more and more complex uh, in itself. And secondly, it leads to a form of uh, uh, questioning of the very body mind dualism that are led to think that some bodies, let's say, uh, white men are superior to others because they are endowed with the full capacity for thinking, right? So in this sense, uh, no, by chance, um, Arne, Arne Linaes, who was one of the founding members of the deep ecology movement in the 70s, went back to Spinoza and said that this is the most, um, uh, not just a, 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 an eccentric anomaly in Western metaphysics, but also the most ecocentric egalitarian form of uh, ontology that we can imagine for the ecological fights of our time. So I'm following Ananias there. Is that an answer? If I can jump on that, I think uh, that's a... Share a question. No, no, I gave no. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, not to pick up our son. <laughs> yeah, it's not. So now, okay, between historians of uh, philosophy, right? Yeah, I would say that the the issue of the how you combine, how you put together, how you balance uh, separation and unity, it is as old as a philosophy. So Plato has the same problem with the Parmenides and Sophists and so on. So and, and basically the, the entire history of the philosophy, or at least the, the entire history of Western philosophy, is a, is a gigantic attempt to work with this uh, tension, separation and unity. And separation, separation gives us something that is uh, pretty good. You know, so for that reason, I can't get you know, when I say, oh, separation of, uh, of the, between spheres is bad. No, separation gave us something really powerful and good. It's the result of the power, power of thinking, but it, it gave us uh, the possibility to get rid of uh, hierarchies, get rid of uh, inequalities. So separation gave us, gave us the possibility to abstract a kind of a universal ego that is uh, equal, abstract, universal, and so on, from the car to can. Now, it's a kind of, a, it's almost fashionable to spit on the car and can, but uh, they gave us that it's uh, kind of uh, important, you know, if, if, we, if we can think and talk about uh, uh, equality and, and in a non-hierarchical world, it's, uh, they, they, they did something for us. But at the same time, this is the question, at the same time, they are doing what you want to do. I agree with you that Spinoza is, so my book, Spinoza is one of them. Yeah. But all of them, all the entire history of philosophy is this a gigantic attempt to work out the, 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 the connection between unity and separation. And basically, in different ways, is a way to create a connection. But connections are, are another result of this power of thinking. So we can create to the connections because uh, we think abstractly, because we can separate, and, we, and then we can reconnect to what our thinking can separate. So what is my polemical point is that, uh, this is a way to go. Another way to go is when I attribute to nature, world, the universe, some qualities. And then I, this is what I would call metaphysics. What, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what a nature is. It's unity of all plurality. It's a, it's a brutal system of a, of a killing or is a harmonious and full of love? I don't know. I have no idea. So 
But my my point is that why today? Well, it's not because like you're a part of nature. That would be my easy answer. But anyway, okay. Then yeah, because I can make myself as a connect to nature. I can, but it's a, not it's a, the, 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 okay. Right. It's nature. Nature. But the point, you cannot. It's a it's a metaphysical answer if I say I am I am I am a part of nature. Yes, I am. But at the same time, I can abstract myself from nature. And I can't destroy, the point is, is one word. I can't destroy nature. Nature well, can yeah. barely destroy yeah. itself. Nature can, can I, the question, can nature destroy itself? Maybe, well, with a meteorite, but, but I can't destroy nature. This is the power of thinking. And, and I cannot stop the power of thinking through a metaphysics. Because I can still create a metaphysics and I can destroy the metaphysics that I created, and therefore I can still create, destroy the entire nature, the planet, and ourselves. So, what we cannot do yet is how to deal with the power of abstraction. And my problem today is that basically we try to stop, stop the power of, of abstraction by creating metaphysics. I'm not saying that you're doing that because of Spinoza is much more sophisticated. But, but I think we, this is where we are stuck. We try to stop this uh, gigantic power by producing metaphysics. That is not the way you can stop abstraction because metaphysics are also abstract. And you want to become my song. Okay, that is very well, that's, that's, uh, that's a piece of okay that. so I just respond very briefly. First of all, you may like abstraction more than I do. I see abstraction as the mode of function of capital. I mean, that's, you know, come from Franco school originally. So for me, uh, capital and modernity precisely works by abstraction. That is by subsuming every life form into quantifiable profit um, abstractive numbers. So I'm not so sure that abstraction is always a good thing. But the, the, the easy answer to you, I mean, of course, the entire history of um, uh, philosophy is a question of uh, separation and unity. The one and many has always been there from the beginning. That's precisely Simon Don point. Simon Don point is to say the entire history of Western philosophy is about how to think the relationship between unity and separation and how to create connections, but because it begins with the individuated beings, Aristotelian logic as the starting point of philosophizing. The whole point of Simon Gibesman um, philosophy of trans individuality is to say we should move away from that Western. Um, modes of philosophizing out to conceptualize the relation between one and many, unity and separation, to one that takes not individuated being, but the process of ontogenesis itself as the starting point of philosophizing. Okay, so that's the, I think, the easiest answer. That was my first philosophical love. Maybe you are never, you never forget your first love. Um, I tend to be very critical of Kant for other reasons, but for instance, I do believe it's cosmopolitanism and the idea that um, the Earth is just one uh, uh, globe, uh, and that precisely because you cannot disperse infinity across the planet, there should be some form of uh, cosmopolitanism, whether it's philosophical or political. I still not subscribe to that and pick up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, we're really out of time, but I, I want to ask a final question because I'm dying to know more. I am so curious about this conception of somatic communism. I knew I that. <laughs> I like hell, I don't know what it means. I only, I'm just thinking like, from each oh, according yeah. to uh, their ability to each according to their need, but then I'm also terrified about what that might mean politically, considering that you're locating this in the body. So, like, what does that mean? I mean, beyond the fact that we're interconnected, yes, but communism has a vision of 
to each according to need, from each according to ability. Like, how does that work right. in terms of bodies? Right. So I take the term of Walter Shadow, uh, who argues that um, uh, it's a critique of the way in which communist uh, and socialist thinking has been centered on the idea of uh, you know, the image of the factory and the idea of uh, the wage uh, earner as the center for thinking about the possibility of revolution, okay? So the questioning of that image to the idea of, you know, the agent of uh, today potentially revolutionary movement are not necessarily the, the, the factory uh, workers. Uh, as it has been the case, but are uh, different uh, bodies that are situated um, across the globe and in, in the spectrum of uh, uh, not just uh, uh, the second sexes, but it also includes people who live at the margins of the system, for instance, uh, um, uh, eco-territorial uh, feminist movement, right? So the provocation is to say somatic communism is the idea that um, because life is interconnected, we should think of some form of uh, socialism or political communism that actually gives to everybody according to their needs. Um, so and there is, a, in, in that sense, I believe, for instance, a, a clear connection between uh, uh, what Bishal is saying and what Kropotkin argues with the idea of mutualism and uh, mutual aid. But the point is, Somali communism doesn't mean political communism automatically, obviously. So uh, it's a vision. Instead of looking at uh, individuals as given entity separated from one another, you look at individuality as a form of processes of becoming. And then how do we become together and how do we come to decide about what we want to share in that process of becoming? Uh, so that's what, let's say, somebody communism gives you a vision. And then how to take this from a political program this I insist a lot on the book, and I confirm is not aimed at providing one single political program because um, uh, it's it's more of a method than a blueprint for the future. I also believe, I mean, this is a really Rosa Luxemburg uh, was very clear that uh, a sort of um, you know in the idea of uh, the mass strike as uh, the revolution itself, I mean, the whole polemic with Lenin and the idea of um, uh, vanguardist uh, politics, uh, the whole idea that you cannot theorize uh, a form of political communism uh, just the expression as if it were a blueprint that you carry in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Because uh, life forms are so infinitely complex and constantly in the process of becoming. So there is no way that you can predict um, how things will evolve uh, in the future, and there's no way in which you can control everything. So, in this sense, when I say you know the image of the Earth as a planet, that is my communist doesn't mean a global communist party who's gonna regulate everything out to stop global warming and so on and so forth. That would be the exact contrary what an anarcho feminism would, would mean. Why? Well, because precisely because differences are so important, particularly in ecological situation, there's no way in which you can know from a bowl all and every single situation across the planet, not only now, but also in 50 years time, right? So you can't close somebody communism into a specific political program. That's why I distinguish between somebody communism and political communism. I rather think of uh, revolution, for me, I think about the revolution as a, a form of interstitial change that begins with the knowledge of also specific um, places and locations, and that, that generates changes from the small 
uh, to the large, you know, and that was the great idea of um, direct democracy, you know, as close as you can to the bottom, right? Uh, and, and that was even in the classical anarchist thinkers, the idea that um, forms of radical democracy, you have to be as close as possible to the bottom, to all affected principle, but only you move up um, when you can't solve a certain issue locally, right? Um, so that would be my response to uh, Somali communism doesn't mean communist world government tomorrow. I mean, actually, that would be terrifying, you know. Um, or that anybody can access anybody's body, yeah. their needs. Yeah, no, exactly. That's why I'm very critical of that form of uh, you know, queer ecology as the mesh and we're all open. I'm like, yeah, we're not. Mm -hmm. No, no, <laughs> we're not. We're all open. I mean, uh, Morton is this, you know, we're open over forever, like, and not really. <laughs> I'm not. No. <laughs> Well, yeah, are, are there any other uh, questions? If not, please join me and thank you. Chiara, we've worked you over time. <laughs> thank you so much. All the questions were very great. on the spot, so uh, very useful.